Hi, I'm Douglas Vo from the Die Hole Foundation. Uh, this is being filmed on June 19th, 2019. Uh, sorry it's taken me some, some time to, uh, about a month and a half, to put up the, my, since my last video. But I had to do taxes and work around my house and, you know, the usual things of living. And so I, and it took time to do this particular video. Uh, what this, what we're going to cover here is uh, my volume one. Uh, by the way, I, I made a pointer. People have been asking me, don't go in front of the screen. <laughs> Use the pointers. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit of both. So we're going to cover why Abraham left Terah's house. Uh, how old uh, was Abraham and Sarah's wife uh, when they left Haran? Haran's where the father lived. Uh, why did Abraham sell his half-sister slash wife twice? Uh, the real reason Abraham purchased the cave of Machpelah. Uh, the real age of Sarah when she gave birth to Isaac. It wasn't 90 years old, as any woman will tell you. Um, I'd like to say this first. For those who are atheists or agnostics, I want you to look at this as really a history of what happened to a late Bronze Age man and family when they discovered this technology of an extremely highly advanced previous civilization. Uh, they were, uh, this technology from a, a civilization tens of millions of years more advanced than us. These people were really different than us. And how it affected these late Bronze Age people, and uh, for you, this doesn't become a religion until after Moses does the surface story of uh, Exodus. So don't look at it as a religious thing. Look at it as a scientific application of what happens to late Bronze Age people, or a primitive people when they come in contact with an extremely advanced technology. For those of you who are rabbis, ministers, priests, you're going to learn stuff that you were never taught in school or seminary, and it's because your teachers and their teachers' teachers didn't know this stuff. Much of it was lost a long, long time ago, not just at the close of the first temple period, but some of this stuff was lost even the time of Solomon, and uh, maybe even sooner. And I want you to look at it with an open mind. You probably already know if you've seen the videos on, on uh, the, Hebrew, the creation of the Hebrew alphabet, you know that I know things that no one else has ever discovered. No one has figured out the model and what the Hebrew alphabet was created from and what it really is, what the Torah actually is. That video is in video two. You should see it if you haven't yet. Anyway. Uh, this video will cover some of the stuffs in chapters 5, 6, and 7 in God's Day of Judgment. This is already a 12-year-old book, but I actually said things in this that I wouldn't have said uh, later on. I actually re revealed more than I really should have. Um, this is obviously the, what I'm going to be training, uh, talking about, this particular volume. Uh, there's about like 24, 25 of them still in Amazon. There's about 200 in the printer now, in the bindery rather, and they should be available probably the first week in, or second week in July, either from Vector or from Amazon. So anyway, uh, this is video series eight. I think there'll only be one part to it, but we just, we'll call it part one here now. Uh, You'll need to know, and you'll see examples of why, you need to know Moses and the Ten Code Systems in order to wind up decoding these things that Moses had encoded in the Torah. Also, you'll find out, you can discover that the priest, a priest or priest in the first temple period, changed the word breaks to come up with a different surface story. Why the Torah must be decoded. Moses had a very difficult time. He basically had two tablets with 304,805 symbols on it. He created the, the Hebrew language as we know it, which consisted of 
Chaldean words, Canaanite, Canaanite, and of course Egyptian words, gave sound values to 20 of the letters, two of them, ayin and aleph, are basically floating vowels. Uh, but there was no vowels in it. There was no room to have vowels. There were only 22 letters. So what happened was, well, I'll, I'll go into it in a few minutes, but he had a very, very difficult time trying to do a surface story. So some of the stuff when I sh you, show, you see here is going to be like, almost like what you call pidgin English. And some, for you English majors, you'll pull your hair out when you see how the sentence was actually put together, but you'll understand why. So forgive the poor guy, you know? Uh, also, you'll have stories that are basically out of, out of chrono chronological order. It's because once he created the, the alphabet and, and the, the language, uh, you know, you, you had a sequence of symbols. You couldn't change any. You couldn't add any letters, couldn't take any away. So he was stuck. So you have uh, parts of the story that are out of sync. Um, some were later, but they show up earlier and vice versa. It's just kind of weird but you have to know what's going on. Hopefully this video is going to teach you something that you were never taught before. By the way, I'm not doing any preaching here. I'm not preaching any kind of a religion. This is really a history and a study. You look at it like a mystery novel. Uh, let me see. Uh, um, Priests in the first temple period deliberately made changes and it was about this is a painting of Abraham. We don't know what Abraham really looked like. There are no statues. Uh, they weren't like the Greeks that did marble statues of everybody that they liked. Okay, Abraham, father was Terah. And they first started out in the city of Ur. This is the Tigris and Euphrates Valley uh, rivers come together. And this is where Ur is right here. And now it's uh, Iraq. And this is where the home of the Chaldeans. So you can actually say he was a Chaldean. And the Chaldeans, well, if you took the ages of Terah literally, that's mentioned in the, in the Torah, he would have been born about 1805, 1802 BCE. And Abraham was born when he was 70 years old or 1732 BCE. Don't believe any of the numbers. You'll see what I mean in a second. The family first lived there, and then after his son, his second son, well, as a, his younger one, he had three sons, Terah, Abraham. When, whenever they, the Torah lists a list of names, the first one is always the oldest, second oldest, third. He dies, Haran, the younger one dies, and then they move from Ur to what's now southern Turkey. So they'd be considered Chaldeans. Later on, though, they changed their names or identity to Ar Armenians. Uh, uh, the language they spoke was Aramaic. They, they shared the same Hebrew alphabet. So there's a reason why. It's because Aram, who was Nahor's, surviving the younger brother of Abraham's, uh, I think it was grandson. So therefore, Abraham was related to Arameans through Nahor. And that's actually important to understand what happened during the fall of the first uh, the kingdom of Israel, and then later the kingdom of Judah, 587. That's actually important. So they moved from Ur to Haran. Haran's obviously named after his youngest son. There wasn't anything there. Pretty good distance. And later, when Abraham leaves, he goes south, actually past Shechem, into the Sinai. This is some ruins that were found in, in Haran, uh, Turkey. Pretty interesting. It looks like pretty good um, foundation that they did here. What, I assume the building above was, was made out of stone, or if it was wood, it's all rotted away. Anyway, at the time Jacob, his uncle Laban, is listed as an Aramean. That's in Genesis uh, 28, 5. I'll try to put all my references in, in square brackets. So Arameans were a subset of the Chaldeans. Uh, when the Bible lists the sons of anyone, obviously the 
The oldest is listed first of the youngest. Uh, the Chaldeans and Arameans combined to defeat the Assyrian Empire and form the Babylonian Empire. As I said, this is an important relationship for the fall of the Kingdom of Israel and later Judah. Now, supposedly within the story, Terah lives to 205 and all these others here live this long. I mean, this long, which is crazy. After the last polar reversal, these people are genetically the same as us. They're not living that long. And this is the second list of genealogy. The first list is, is be, uh, listed before when I showed in, in uh, uh, decoding the Hebrew, Hebrew alphabet. Part two, you'll see, if you see that video, you should, um, what Moses did and how he presented this number, 12,068. So he's pushed all these numbers so it would add up, in this case, horizontally to 12,068 or here vertically, plus the 98 years before the flood, 6,034 times 2 gives you the 12,068 number. In all, all fairness, I think the reason Moses did that uh, is because he felt that it was much more important that people know that number and what it was all about and what it was that was coded throughout the whole Torah than really literally how old these guys lived. And it's because he probably didn't know how old they lived either. I can't imagine what kind of records they would have to say how old they did leave. Maybe his father, maybe a grandfather, but the rest of them, forget it. I, I just don't believe it. Uh, this is another example from Adam to Abraham's son, supposedly he's 100 years old, get that. 2046, which is the year for the next Gleisberg cycle, as, as I showed in video series seven, uh, it's most likely when this polar reversal and cataclysm is gonna happen. So basically the Torah, Moses has given us the exact date of when this event's gonna happen. Um, now, the reason I'm showing this picture is this. This is important for later. Uh, from Afghanistan all the way, this was a mass wedding of 450 of these older guys. They look like well, well past their 20s or in their 20s or past their teens. They're marrying girls that are, this one was I think eight or nine years old. And this one may be 11. Now in our society, we call this, these pedophiles, here it's called a wedding. Uh, it's reported that this girl actually died from, died of bleeding to death. You can guess why. Um, that's actually important to understand. If they're doing it now, you can bet your sweet bippy they were doing it 3,500 years ago at the time of Abraham. And you'll understand why I'm saying that in a second. So anyway, series six, part two is the video where I go through the numbers and stuff like that. Okay, why did Abraham leave his father's house? The Torah surface story only tells us that God told Abraham when he was 75 years old, there's a reference, to leave his father's house. And the Torah also tells us that Terah was alive at the time because it says Terah lived to 205 years old. It means Terah was 145 years old when, he, uh, when Abraham left him, uh, left Haran and went south. Sarah was, we find out later, was 10 years younger. So she was 65 years old. This is the surface story of the Torah. And there's the reference for it. Hittite fertility god is Telepanu. Moses mentions the same idol in Genesis 3119 and 3134, and it is spelled this way, Terapanu, which is basically pronounced the same. What was interesting. In Egyptian, they didn't use the letter L too much, so he substituted with an R, something like the Chinese. And they have a hard time saying L's. And the N and the M are interchangeable, or you could swap them in one of the codes, adjacent letter swaps you can do. So this is the same word that Moses is writing here. So we know it's this idol. Now, this is important. 
This is, you're going to find it in a second, what Jacob gave Joseph that all his brothers were jealous of and wanted to get rid of him. <clears throat> There's nothing in the Torah that says that Terah made idols. So why, we have two, we have two legends that say that Terah made idols. Uh, one is, and, and supposedly, well, I'll go into the legends. Here's a, a brief synopsis of one of them. You can find these in, in um, Lewis Ginsburg, Volume 1, Abraham, the Iconoclast. One is the king in the area has a party, comes home and finds, back to the palace, and he finds all his idols are destroyed and broken. He inquires, and dear old Abraham's name pops up, and he's obviously pissed off, and he's got to leave town fast. The other legend says basically um, Abraham uh, follows away. Abraham broke almost all of his father's idols except the big one, which he puts a hatchet in, in, in its hand, and tells his father, well, I was going to give me to the other ones, and the big idol got mad and destroyed all the other ones. And then the father gets pissed off and said, you're lying to me. These are just idols. They don't mean anything. Inanimate objects. And then Abraham says, uh, then why do you pray to them? So, um, and then he winds up leaving town. Okay, that's the surface story. So where did they get this side, where did they get these two legends? Make no, 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 no doubt about it. The guy who wrote this legend is the one who did what I'm going to show you next. And it has to do with uh, Abraham's age. Uh, okay, the first code that Moses gives us is the number 70 in the age of Terah when he has uh, Abraham. This is why. It goes back to the, the code systems of the total of the chapter and verses that describe a coat of many colors or a long sleeve coat. The Hebrew word is this. I won't try butchering it. And the first, and it shows a, a slight variation in verse 23 and, and 33. So first word means shirt or tunic. However, if you swap the, the nun for the mim, adjacent letter swap, so one of the code systems, you get the word katim, which means fine gold. The next word uh, was a hard one to, for the translators. When you drop the yud and change the mim to a lamed, a next adjacent letter, you get the word uh, patel, pasel, which means a carved or cast idol. And you put two together is a cast golden idol. Now you know the gift that Jacob gave Joseph <coughs> uh, the idol. It wasn't the lonesome coat, it was the idol. It's also the idol that's mentioned in the story about Rachel, who stole the family fertility god from Laban, her father, and she sat on it while she's pregnant with Benjamin. Father finally catches up with them someplace in, in Israel, it's now Israel. And they make a truce of some sort. You know, they don't kill each other off. And, but the way God gets even is Rachel, when she gives birth to Benjamin, she dies in childbirth. Now, I'm going to tell you something important. For the reform movement, they seem to be pushing uh, social justice. The Bible is not social justice. It is divine justice. In other words, if you do something wrong, God punishes you. It has nothing to do with social justice. That comes out of the mind of Stalin, who used that phrase for the dumb and the stupid for in the 1940s and 50s um, and 30s for social justice. It has nothing to do with social justice. The Bible has to do with divine justice. Okay, a little, a little further 
uh, technical history of the of the Torah of the what what Moses had to deal with. This is a string of letters. What it looked like from Numbers chapters three one. It's just a string. No word breaks. No vowels. No nothing. That's what they had to do, and they had to go break this up. This string of code. The priests had to remember where the word breaks were and how to pronounce the sentence. Hence, they had to remember where the proper vowels went. By the way, they used to have singers that would memorize blocks of the Torah, because you can remember more with right brain than left brain, and they would sing it. They were, they were taught to memorize the blocks and sing it so they knew how to, present the word, how to pronounce the words and where the word breaks were. We also assume that when, at the end in Deuteronomy, Moses says that he has a copy of, of, of the writings and put it next to the ark, we assume he's the one who put in the word breaks, and I'm sure he did. I'll go on further. Uh, <clears throat> the diacritical marks were created by the Mesoric, uh, uh, Mesoric scholars in Jerusalem and Babylon between the 6th and 10th century of the Common Era. They did, not, they did not exist during the time of Moses, the Judges period, first and second, second temple periods. I guess they felt it was so necessary that, to make a copy of the Torah that actually um, you could pronounce or know where the word breaks were and how to pronounce the words. And you'll understand why in a, in a second when I show you a page from the dictionary. Uh, they knew they had some bad um, copies or they had bad problems with some of the letters where the scribe screwed up basically. Some of it, I'm sure, an honest screw up. But it changes the letters, and you're going to see which ones they changed. Anyway, these are the vowels. There's 14 of them. The, the line across means the baseline, and here they pronounce it, A, E, I, O, and U. And, and this is the problem. This is the, the major part of the problem. Here's an example among many, Het, Bet, Resh. And we've got six different translations for different words for the same exact three letters except for the diacritical marks. You can see it. Bound together, united together, and even variations thereof. Conjure sorcerer, an associate, joined, united, associated, champion friend, community company. You understand the problem. There's hundreds like this. <laughs> This was just like six, but it was some three and four. I mean, it's just, it's a nightmare. So any English major out there and say, how do you do a story like this? And you're right. I mean, it's just, how does a writer do anything with something like this, with, with such limited tools? By the way, my eyes aren't so hot. I'd have a hard time reading some of these little diacritical marks, to tell you the truth. Okay, then we have the problem of a scribe screwing up because he didn't write the letter right. Yod and Vav are easily uh, mixed up. You can see this is the whole waveform. The line across here means it, it crossed the x-axis. Here, here's the Vav and the waveform. Here's the old thing. You can see it's very similar to this except for the tail in here. So if the guy goofed and didn't put the tail in all the way, he may think it's this. So eventually they did solve the problem, the Mesorics, and changed it to that. Looks like an apostrophe. Here's another one, very common, and I found several of these. Tav, Chet, and He. Tav because this part of it descends below the baseline, as opposed to, as you've shown here. Here's the waveform. It was like this. Chet, they're all next to it. 45 degrees, 90, 135. Here, the line goes straight up on top, and they're both even. Here, the het, it's further away. The line is below. It's supposed to be a space here, because there's a space here. It's behind it. This line is behind this one, in other words, and here. You could see they had a real tough problem with all of them. So you got to be careful if you're trying to do the research and, and carry on my work and go beyond. Watch out for this problem. 
Okay, there's five places in Genesis that talk about Abraham's or Sarah's age, only five. Uh, this is the accepted translation. And Abraham was 70 and five years old when he de uh, departed, left Haran, didn't die. Here's the literal uh, translation of the Hebrew words. And he is going, Abraham, as which he spoke to him, Yahweh, and he is going with him, Lot, and Abraham, son of five, son of five years and 70 year, into go forth of him, from Haran. Talk about pigeon English. Genesis 16, 16, and Abraham was 80 and six years old when Hagar bore Is Ishmael to Abraham. And Abraham, son of 80, six, 80 year and six years into birth of Hagar Ishmael for Abram. His original name was Abram. See? Next one, and when Abraham was 90 years, 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be thou perfect. And he is becoming Abraham's son of 90 year and nine years, and he is appearing, Yahweh, to Abraham. He is saying to him, I'm not going to go on further, 1717, when Abraham fell upon his face, and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and, sh and shall Sarah that is ninety years old, that's how we know he's ten years younger, he is fallen, uh, Abraham, on his on face of him, and he is laughing, and he is saying, In heart of him, to son of a hundred years, he shall be born, etc., etc. Last one. And Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Again, son of 90 and nine year old. Now notice seven, uh, uh, verse one, it was 90, he was 99 years old. Then the last one, he's 100 years old. And then again, at the end of 17, he's 99 years old, which, which is a small example of why things are out of, sync, out of sequence. What all these five have in common is you cannot be the son of a number. To me, that was a red light, and I said, something's wrong. So I went to the laborious task. Oh, let's do, let's do fertility first of male and female. To know right off the bat those five verses are blatantly wrong. This is the fertility rate of females. I think it was of Denmark. 1947 is the blue, and 1957 is the red. They start off in puberty, hit a peak around the 30s, late 20s, 30s, and it drops off after menopause. It's zero. 60, 70, 80, 90. There's no more eggs. No more eggs, no more babies. Here's the average percent of eggs with normal DNA. Again, fine here, drops off. When this drops off, it means the other uh, curve that shows miscarriages go up like this. After 50, kiss it off, there's none. Here's males. Everybody forgets about dear old Abraham. He had fertility of 1,000 males in 2002. Again, hits a peak around 20s, 30s, and drops off. 55 and older, forget it. By 70, 80, and 90, you don't have any viable sperm cells. Kiss it off. You're as sterile as the woman is. So, these people are genetically just like us. Can they be having a child at, when she's 90 years old? At, him fathering one? No. So now you understand what's wrong. Yeah, you're going to understand what's wrong. Next part. Oh, there's more evidence. You'll enjoy this. This is when, when Terah gave Abraham 
his, uh, uh, his stepdaughter. He must have married a woman and had a daughter from somebody else. We assume it's that. Could be a daughter, half-daughter. Anyway, this is a cuneiform tablet that Terah would have given Abraham when he gave, her name was Sari, to Abraham. This is actually a slave contract from this area. Here's an Assyrian marriage contract. So he must have had sex with her. We don't know how much time after. And he got this, that Terah made him a, a, um, a cuneiform tablet. They baked them. It was the clay. They, they put the um, uh, cuneiform writing on it, and then they bake it and they have a clay tablet. So he had two. One, he owned her as a slave, and the other one, marriage contract. And that's important to learn later. Okay. <clears throat> he has further proof that the story, well, where they went and what happened in Egypt. Statements by Genesis, Genesis 11, 29 states that Sarah is his wife. The next verse tells him she was infertile. Um, Genesis, uh, Genesis 12, 6, the literal translation is, and he is passing Abraham in the land as far as place of Shechem. Doesn't mean he stayed there, he's just passing it. As far as Terabith, or Oaks, of Morah, Moriah, and the Canaanite then in the land. Uh, it is true. The Canaanite, southern Canaanite border was um, the Brook of Egypt, a.k.a. also known as um, Wadi El Arish. That was the Brook of Egypt. It does not say they stayed in Shechem, only that they passed through it. Uh, it was telling us the direction of travel. The Hebrew words for terebinth or oak, mora, is this. Yeah. Alum mora. The ale, this is how it had, had to take the word. You have to take the words apart in order to figure out what Moses is really saying. Al, in, in the direction of or to, vav means and. Final nun, in Hebrew small numbering, is seven, which represents Mount Sinai because of the seven scars on one side of its face. The new translation would be in the direction of Mount Sinai. Uh, Mora is, is spelled, uh, is spelled Mora, which means teaching, instruction, or teacher. The final translation would be in the direction of Mount Sinai for instruction or learning. That same verse and um, Definitions were given by Moses a number of other times later. Um, Abraham and his family stayed there for an indeterminate period of time. In other words, he went from Haran directly to Mount Sinai and where that cave was. At first, I thought that uh, he didn't learn about the, the Gilgamesh and the legends of Tillman until when he went to Egypt. But I don't think so now. I think he... He actually knew about both legends, and he, he made a beeline there. He knew what he was going for. Uh, Gen uh, Genesis 12, 10, and Abraham traveled to Egypt with his family. When they arrived in Egypt, uh, Abram tells his wife to tell the Egyptians that she is his sister. And it came to pass you're going to enjoy this, you really like this, and I'll tell you what's going on here. And it came to pass that when Abraham was come to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman very lovely. And the princes also of Pharaoh, that means the Pharaoh's sons, saw her and commented her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he dwelt, he dwelt well with a Abram, well for her sake, and he had, he had sheep and oxen and he, he asses and manservants and maidservants and she asses and camels. That's called a dower, where the husband, where the, I should say it, the father of the bride 
receives money from the groom or the father of the groom for the girl. He sold her for this. But he got more than just that. By verse 18, the Pharaoh discovered Sarah was also his wife and gave her back to Abram and had him leave Egypt immediately. We do not know how much time had passed in Egypt. Uh, the re women are not going to like what I'm about to say, but it's unfortunately the truth. Any historian will tell you that. Uh, in this period of time, men married women or got women for one purpose. Uh, it was to have children so they could wind up increasing their wealth and they needed male manpower to do the farming and stuff like that. It appears the women were nothing more than an extra mouth to feed until you could find someone you could sell her to. And that seems to be the problem. I think they may have had a shortage of women, especially if they're marrying them off that young. Some of them died either during the, the, the wedding night or definitely childbirth. So that's, I think, what happened. Genesis 13.2. By the way, remember the two tablets. So he probably showed the Pharaoh the first tablet, which said, hey, you know, I own her. Give me money. And the second one, somehow miraculously appears and shows it's his wife. <clears throat> and Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south, even to Bethel, which I'll explain with Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning. And where was he, I'm saying? Mount Sinai between Bethel and Ai, I'll explain Ai in this, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. At the end of this, towards the end of this video, you're going to see the real Abraham's altar. I'm the only one who could say that for real. <clears throat> okay, Bethel is spelled Bethel. Beth means dwelling place and El means a god. Together, God's dwelling place. Gee, what could that possibly be? Hmm, the cave in Mount Sinai. Chapter 20 is out of sequence again. Gerar, that's where he goes. He goes from Egypt directly to the town of Gerar, where there's a king there, because Gerar is where Abraham was living. Near the town of Gerar is where he went after leaving Egypt. Sorry, that's Sarah, sorry would be now 68 or older if the surface story was right. So pick this. Do you think the Pharaoh who could have any woman in Egypt would be going after a 66 or 67 year old woman? Can't have kids. You see, right off the bat, from the surface story, you could tell it ain't possible. Now, if you think this is a miracle that she had kids at 90, why don't you go ask your mother a sister if you got one, your grandmother, or any woman. And after she laughs her head off at you, maybe you'll wake up. <clears throat> Genesis 22, and Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took her. <laughs> he sold her again. <laughs> Later in verse 14, Abraham gets paid for the transaction, Genesis 4, 14. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen, manservants, woman servants, and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. And then in verse 16, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. I'm going to explain this whole thing. Moses is now telling you where Abraham got the 400 shekels of silver to pay for the hill from Ephron the Hittite. He's telling you right here. Sold his sister twice. <clears throat> Make no mistake, Sari went along with this completely. Here's her choices. Living in a tent with her half-brother with some concubines, maybe farm animals, or living in the 
palace of the pharaoh or the castle of or palace of Abimelech from the king of Gerar. What would be your choice if you're a woman? For the girls I've known, a no-brainer. <laughs> you're out the door, I'm going. <laughs> this is the solution to the problem. Some of you are going to be really surprised, especially the, the theologians and stuff like that. You're going to be really surprised and shocked. And um, uh, this is what took, took time to figure out uh, what I'm gonna, about to show you. I'll try to do it in brief. This is running long. Genesis, the first one, uh, where it says he's 70 and five years old when he departed. Uh, this is what the phrase looks like in Hebrew. What I did is I broke it differently to like this. So first letter means build, form, or develop. This is the case where I think the het should have been a he, he for the reason I explained earlier. The next word, mish, I can't pronounce it, uh, means to touch or to feel. The next two words, vav, num, which translates to and fugitive. This mirrors the legend where he had to leave town because he was a fugitive. Um, Heron because he had broken the king's idols, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the next three letters, uh, shin, bet, ayin means to be abundant or full, filled. The last is yod, mim, which means see. Uh, if I attempted a, a, a translation, it would be Abraham put together all his possessions and went to the sea, seacoast, as a fugitive. That matches the legends. The guy who wrote the legend either had the original break of what it, the story should have been and changed it to cover it up. And you'll understand partially why. I'll tell you the three reasons why I think they covered it up. Next one. Hagar bore him a son. Uh, Abram was 86 years old. Here's the, the literal translation. I broke the line differently. This is how I broke it. You read it from right to left. And Abraham's only son was fat, sleep, and only an old pair of cotton after birth dwelled near, with near sound of Abraham. Now, and Hagar bore a, a Abram a son, and Abram called his son, which Hagar bore Ishmael. Verse 6, in the original translation, the accepted one, it goes ahead and tells you the, the age of Abraham, which who cares? This makes more sense. The baby's born, he's telling you something about the baby. He's fat, he slept a lot, and he only had a pair of cotton wrappings, I guess, <coughs> after birth, and he lived near Abraham within sound of Abraham. That makes more sense, and it fits the story, the paragraph. Next one, current translation, and when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be perfect. Okay. Uh, I divided the letters again differently. Same letters, just divided them differently. First word means to root out or expel. Second word, ein uh, yod, means a heap of stones or rubbish. Third world, mim shin, is, is, is part of the world which says carry in or burden. Let me explain something. Many times, and I'm gonna show you an example later, the only like, of a three letter word, they only had two letters. And the, the priest assumed it was the three letter word. Same thing goes for, for four letter words, they threw three of them and they did that. And I'm gonna give you an example in a few minutes. So this is a common practice. They didn't have the whole word, the whole correct spelling, they didn't care. They said, we're gonna assume it's this. <clears throat> okay, we're going to run up to it. And the fifth word, this, shortened to version that, but the vav could be added with a, a vowel dot over the shin. The meaning of the word is, is help, deliverance, salvation. Sixth word, shin, this. The second or second time. Uh, the seventh word means from f fearing or from being afraid. 
And the last word is, of course, God. The new arrangement of words, Abraham was removing stones from the cave. He was living there, remember. And the, sec the second time sees the splendor of God. This was, in fact, the second time he hears God and sees God. And we know, I prove to you, uh, this is the same place. It was all the family, this became the family homestead after he bought it. This one was hard for me to do because it was kind of interesting. Um, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old and Sarah 90, 90 years old? Here's the literal translation of what we accept today. If you read the thing, it, it still doesn't make any sense when you put all the pieces together here. A, my translation turned out to be, and miraculously Abraham was overcome, crying and dazzling white light of God is saying not to go further in center of Sinai a hundredth time. Also, he shall bring forth last night to fear the daughter of nine year she shall birth. Now, this is maybe where Moses is telling us how old Sarah was when Abraham got her as his possession, as his property. A nine-year-old girl, just like that picture. So, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting if he's going for a nine-year-old. It's kind of interesting how, how that could, you know, why he would do something like that. But that seems to be par for the course. Uh, you know, I don't know. Okay, let me explain. Let me explain what's happened just now what I've shown you. One, <clears throat> I think Abraham, when he left Haran, he knew about the two mythologies, uh, legends of Gilgamesh and also Tilman or Dilman. Dilman is in this area, by the way. And I think what happened is he went into the cave, found the cave, went in there, stayed there for a period of time, maybe a couple of years, two, three years. Wanted to buy the place and the price was too high. So he had to figure out a way to make money to buy the cave. So he, he got this idea he had a very pretty possession, his wife, half-sister, who was maybe then 12, 13 years old. Uh, and uh, he took her down, to, went down to Egypt, and you saw what happened. The pharaoh immediately grabbed her, paid him. And then, some, and then after that, when he had enough money, and it, they may have been in Egypt for years, it said that he left with lots of gold and silver. It means he was there for a period of time. We don't know how much time, but maybe three, four, or even five years. Got got enough money, and then he it was revealed that it was his his wife. Now the pharaoh must have known something was up. She wasn't getting pregnant at all, and he may have given her back to her sooner than that. We don't know, and so. Uh, he made a beeline back to uh, the hill and did the same scam to Abimelech, king of Gerar, uh, and got the thousand pieces of silver which he used to buy the cave and the land around it and the hill. He bought the whole thing. And uh, that's it. Uh, the both of them went through it. Now they'll think, the reason why he was tested by God to sacrifice his, his only son, uh, God, I think, wanted to make sure that this guy wasn't a, still a schemer and actually changed his ways. And I think that's what happened. Okay. There's the real, the western end of the real Abraham's altar. It's not in Jerusalem. That was Solomon's lie. <clears throat> this is what 
Moses built the sacrificial altar, which originally it looked like this. And on top of this was a big brass, a square brass um, uh, sacrificial altar was put on top of it. And this thing was round. This thing was round. It had a step here, and the, the, the legs of the sacrificial rested here. This is what's left after 3,305 years. I think that's when it was, when I took this picture in 97. <clears throat> so it's not going to look too good. And many of the stones were taken by the Bedouins to bury their dead. But this is what it looked like, and Abraham's altar was in there. I dug in this area. I did this late at night. The second expedition was 97, uh, 99, rather, and I arranged it at the, the full moon. Took one picture, that's it, from this side. And I found the same kind of construction that I found at Moses' first altar at the southwestern base of the hill. <clears throat> These are two big, huge stones. In other words, he didn't build this thing the day he was going to sacrifice Isaac. This is the altar he built when he first arrived there, as Moses tells us. Here's all the pictures. This is the eastern side of it. This is put up by, by the Bedouins and stuff like that. They just made a pile of rocks there. This is the north side of it. And this is the top of Sinai. You can see it's fairly flat. So the tent of meeting, which was 201 feet by 100 feet, no problem fitting it in. It's not like that, that mountain and the southern part of the Sinai. You couldn't even fit a, you couldn't put a lean-to in there. It was so, it's so rocky on the top of that. No. This is big enough to put that size of a curtain around the thing. That's all it was. Here's the north side. This I did in 97, and I did a sample test for the soils and stuff like that, and this is what the thing looks like now. Proof Moses <clears throat> that this is Abraham's sacrificial altar and Mount Sinai. In Genesis chapter 13, 18, all these chapters, they all state that Abraham lived by the plains of Mimri, or the uh, uh, terabits of Mimri. Uh, 13, 18, when Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt among the Terbins Oaks of Memory, which is in Hebron. You'll see the translation of Trevin. And built there an altar unto the Lord. The word Memory is spelled this way and is made up of two words. The first one, first three letters, translates to sorrow or bitterness. If you take the last letter, Aleph, to be the first, the number one in Hebrew, small numbering or large numbering, you get the meaning first sorrow or bitterness. This would be definitely um, the family burial cave, the surface story that he bought it to bury his wife. That would be the first sorrow. <clears throat> the Hebrew word for Balini, which is translated either <coughs> as terebins or oaks, the B uh, means in or at, the Aleph Lamed, means a god or mighty one. And finally, nun yud means wailing or lament. The final meaning of this word is at God's wailing place. Has to be Mount Sinai or the cave. The last word, Hebron, is spelled this way. The word is made up of two smaller words and a final number. The word is heber, which means to be united or to be bound or joined. And the final letter, nun, is equal to seven in small numbering since the number seven represents Mount Sinai. And the final meaning is bound to Mount Sinai or bound to the mountain. Contract with God and testing Abraham. I'm almost done, by the way. Chapter 22, which is where God tests Abraham's loyalty to only one God. It goes through it. I'm, I'm going to read, read it because... Uh, it'll become self-evident. God did prove Abraham and said uh, uh, unto him, Abraham, and he shall, here am I. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and take thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass 
and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, there's the other clue. This is the clue, and that's a clue. I actually say that the cleave wood is the clue. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in, in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Several things. One, you're going to go sacrifice someone. You're going to build an altar. You're going to spend the time to build an altar. You should know, understand how big those rocks are and what's, I assume, it's made of the rest of the stuff. It takes a long time, and this guy's supposedly 112 or 13 years old and doing it. If the surface story was right, not happening. The other thing is, it takes four days to go to Jerusalem. That's where Solomon says they're going to sacrifice Isaac, right? Was in, well, that's a four-day journey from Beersheba, not three days. It is a three-day walking distance from Beersheba to the hill. Also, Jerusalem was, was and still is a wooded area. It had forests and stuff like that. Why would it be taking wood for the sacrifice if you're going to a place you know there's a forest and wood? You wouldn't, would you? You'd only do it if you're going to the desert or a savanna where there isn't too much wood, if any at all. So in the surface story, you could tell something's wrong. Okay, legends say uh, there were two Abraham loyalty. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, I haven't told too many people. <coughs> On both expeditions, the driver uh, we had, his name was Abraham. The Egyptian guide, his name was Ishmael. My Jewish name is Eliezer. I can't make this stuff up. It's just one more point that we're in a created reality. I just want to know who, who did the programming. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld behind him a ram caught in the thicket uh, by his horns. And Abraham called the name of that place Adonai Jahar as it is said to this day in the mount where the Lord is seen. Who's writing this stuff? It's Moses. Where is he? Well, he's writing it after they leave Mount Sinai, but the story is he's at Mount Sinai. So if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, therefore A is equal to C. That's another code that Moses uses. So if Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac at this place, and it's the same place where you see God, and it's the same place where Moses is where he sees God, therefore A is equal to C, where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, is the same place Moses is at Mount Sinai. And the proof is you just saw the real Abraham's altar. Moses just buried it to protect it inside the same, the, uh, uh, his own sacrificial altar. By the way, there's a, a legend called the Contest of the Mountains made by a high priest who knew the truth. And it's all these mountains are trying to say, who's going to get the Shekinah, the, the light of God? And finally, God gives it to this small, insignificant mountain or hill because no foreign worship was ever, idol worship was ever there. So the priest is telling him, it's not one of the big mountains, it's a small mountain, it's a hill. <clears throat> okay. Moriah, yeah, again, taking the words apart, spelled this way. Uh, Moriah is made up of two words. The first one, mora, which means teaching or instruction. 
The second yod hey is shortened for, for God, therefore instruction of God. Adonai Jahar is spelled this. Adonai, yod hey vav hey, I pronounce it Yehuvah, uh, Jahar. First word, Yehuvah, is, is the full word for the name for God. And the second one is pronounced Erich, which means to be seen. The final translation would be where God is seen. So you could see, well, this, there's, a, there's another word that's close to the second word also that's pronounced about the same, almost spelled the same way, which means fear, terror, revenge, uh, or awe. Could be the same idea of regarding God. You fear God. So what you learned is even the words that Moses used for proper names all go back to Mount Sinai or some feature of Mount Sinai or about God's instructions. This is the part I, I, I was going to, I want to show you. And uh, the first time that Vic I, and I were there at the mountain in 1997, um, Ishmael, myself, and Vic, we first explored the north side of the hill. Uh, and then we went back to camp, had lunch. And then Vic was too tired, so we went in the tent and kind of went to sleep. Uh, Ishmael and myself, we explored the back side, the south side of the, of the hill. <clears throat> That's when I found first uh, 12 piles of rocks and where the 12 standards were. The second expedition, I actually brought a, a, a PhD in, in uh, sedimentology uh, from Germany and uh, a um, um, Bachelor of Science degree in geology from Colorado School of Mines, which you know, I knew. And I had them go through those 12 piles of rocks to make sure that I wasn't deluding myself, that they found the same 12 also and made sense. Of, what pattern it was in, and they did, and they came up with the same numbers. And when I do the videos on, on Volume 3 on the Exodus, you'll actually see it. It's also in the book. So what happened? Uh, no more than 70, 80 feet away from where I found these fault piles of rocks, I see a bush. It almost looked like sagebrush, uh, but it wasn't sagebrush. It was some kind of a, a bush. And inside the bush... I find this, two ram's horns. They cannot be the same ones. These things cannot be 3,500 years old. No way. From then on, I looked at every bush of where I was exploring the Sinai and never found another two. I don't know what to make of it, but I'll, what happened is I came back to the camp, saw Vic laying down, woke up. And I said, guess what I found And I, in a bush? And I threw it on the ground, and he said, oh, my God. <laughs> so he knew this thing about a ram caught in it. Thinking, I don't know why I, I found it. I don't know why it was there. I'm just throwing it out there. That's what I found. This is, uh, there's a legend that a high priest did. And as I already tell you, this is Solomon's lie that uh, Abraham's altar is in Jerusalem. And the reason why he lied was his father, David, had collected all this building materials to build a temple. But then David, who was an Ephraimite, was given the priestly robes and sat in front of the ark. And God told him, no, someone in the far future is going to build it, not you. And... Solomon decided he's the one in the far future, and he built it. But he needed a reason to build it, so he wound up making this lie. And the priests knew it was a lie. And, and in, uh, in Second Chronicles, you ignore First Chronicles totally. It's not a Jewish book. It was written by the Romans. And in uh, Second Kings, it tells the story. First, uh, David buys the, the thrasher for Ornan, and later it's told, Orush. Well, why is two different names? Well, the priest is telling you there's something wrong with this story. And there is. And so 
they also created a legend. And the legend was created by Ahia. He was, that's the, his real name. Uh, he, he was a scribe, but his real name, his priestly name is something else. And I'll go into that one in volume four. But anyway, this is, this is the, the legend. Solomon's two scribes, I can't pronounce his name, and Ahia deserve mention. He ordered the demons to carry them both to lose and only the only spot on the earth in which an angel of death has no power. First clue, got to be maybe Mount Sinai or inside. <coughs> uh, in a jiffy, the demon had done his bidding, but the two se uh, secretaries expired at the very moment of reaching the gates of Luz. The fate destined for them was to die at the gates of Luz, and the angel of death had been at a loss how to get them there. The, the legend is much longer, but not that much longer. It's longer. The clues are lose. I'm not going to tell you what the clue is, but the clue is lose. And the legend, this legend, was done by this priest. No question about it. And it's because the priest would rather die where he knew the real Abraham's altar was than this lie that Solomon had created. That's the reason why. It's the end. I hope you enjoyed it. You certainly learned more than you ever did in school. And I don't blame your teachers so much because they didn't really have a chance. Um, nobody knew this stuff. Uh, the ones who did died out, and like Baruch, the grandson of Jeremiah, and they weren't allowed to tell. They weren't going to give the clues of how to find this thing. And they uh, remember, this is all to keep the real location of Mount Sinai a secret and what was in it. That's the whole purpose of this thing. I hope you got something out of it. Um, the Whole Foundation is a... Believe it or not, a science foundation, but we, we kind of morphed into this also because it's what happens to a primitive people when they, they meet up with such technology and how it changed their lives forever. Anyway, enjoy it. The next, one, the next video will be on Joseph, and that's probably, to me, the most interesting story in the Torah. I think 25 or 30 percent of the Torah is about directly or indirectly about Joseph, and it's fascinating. It's why 11 of the 12 tribes became slaves. You'll love it.